Well, again, good morning. good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel, Quincy, California. Turn with me in your Bibles this morning to the book of Revelation. We're going to continue our study in Revelation in chapter 11. Running right through the book, it's an amazing book. We don't want to lose uh, any of those things that we've gained thus far uh, in Revelation. Now, the title of this book and its theme is found in the very first verse of the book, and you should know this by now. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's the unveiling. It's the revealing of Jesus Christ in His glory. This book begins with a revelation of Jesus in His glory, and it continues with Jesus, the Lamb of God, who is also, by the way, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, releasing it's Jesus that does this, by the way. Releasing the seals which release the wrath of God upon this Christ-rejecting world. Chapter 19, he returns, defeats all his enemies, and sets up his kingdom, and we return with him. Now the key word that's found in the book of Revelation, and you should also know this by now, what is it? Throne. It's the word throne. It's found 46 times in the book of Revelation. And the importance of that word is that it reminds us that God is still on the throne. Amen? Amen? No matter what we see going on in the world around us. And again, remember that. Remember that God's on the throne. God has not been dethroned. Satan is not on the throne. God is on the throne. And he's firmly in control of world events. Amen? So no matter what we see in the world around us, remember that God is still on the throne. And so that word occurs over and over again in the book of Revelation. And as I've mentioned also, every time that we've uh, gone through a chapter of this book, that this is the only book in the Bible that comes with its own outline. And if we follow the outline, we begin to understand the chronology of the book of Revelation. Jesus told the Apostle John in Revelation 1.19, he said, Write the things which you have seen, that's the first point of the outline, and the things which are, that's the second point, and the things which shall take place after this, that's the third point. So, Chapter 1 is the revelation of the glorified Christ in heaven corresponding to the things which you have seen. Chapters 2 and 3 are the seven letters to the seven churches representing the complete age of the church and that corresponds to the things which are. We're living in that point of the outline right now. And then chapters 4 through 22 correspond to the last point of the outline, the things which shall take place after this. Well, after what? After the age of the church is over, after the church has been raptured to heaven, then the things from chapter 4 in Revelation through chapter 2 begin to take place. And that's the chronology of the book of Revelation. Now, chapter 10, uh, which we went through last week, through chapter 11, about verse 14, is another break in the chronology of the book of Revelation. It's a parenthetical section. In a sense, uh, within the parenthesis of this section, we have described several key personages that are found in the book of Revelation that, that, that walk through this time period. It doesn't advance the chronology, but it gives us some explanation of those people. Chapter 11, which we are going to look at this morning in just a moment, is about the two witnesses. They're Old Testament personages uh, sent to witness to mankind. And at the completion of their ministry, they return to heaven. Then the chronology begins to advance again. The seventh trumpet is blown. And that releases the seven final bowls of the wrath of God's judgment. And that also begins, by the way, the second half of the tribulation period. 
Uh, Lucia, can you bring up the next slide? So if you look at the slide, we're right here. The seven trumpets are about to begin. This is the first half of the tribulation. Hopefully you all picked up one of these handouts when we first started this study. And right here, we begin the second half of the tribulation. Now the personages, we'll talk, you can go back to that for other slide, Lucia. But the personages we talked about, or we'll talk about this morning, their ministry will cover the first half of the tribulation. This is an explanation of their ministry during that time. So if you're not already there, turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Revelation, chapter 11, starting in verses 1 and 2. Then I, that's John the Apostle, then I was given a reed like a measuring rod. And the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. But leave out the court which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles, and they will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. That's three and a half years. John once again becomes an active participant in this vision, just like he did in chapter 10, verses 8 through 11. Here he was given a reed, like, like a measuring rod. And, and these reeds, by the way, uh, that John would have been familiar with, grow in the Jordan Valley. And they were about 10 feet tall, and they were, they were uh, valued because of their, their strength and their straightness. And they were often used as, as measuring sticks. So John would have been very familiar with this type of reed as a measuring stick. And he's told by the angel, and it must have been the last angel we saw from chapter 10, he's told to rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. Now, this wasn't to find out the size and dimensions of the temple because no size and dimensions are given here. This was a picture of God's ownership. God was staking out, as it were, his ownership claim, not only over that ground, that temple area, but also those who worshiped there. That these were his own, and this space belongs to him. We're going to talk about that space in a moment. But God was likewise making a distinction between those who were his and those who were not. The angel said, leave out the court which is outside the temple. Don't measure it. It's been given to the Gentiles. Now, outside of the temple proper, that's the place where the, the priest could go, the, the, the holy place, and, and the high priest could go into the holy of holies. So outside of the temple proper, there was a court called the court of the men. Only Jewish men could go there. And outside the court of the men was the court of the women, and only Jewish women could go there. And outside of that area was the outer court region of the temple. And this was as far as Gentiles, that is, non-Jewish people, could go. Anyone who was not a Jew who went further uh, could be immediately killed for desecrating the temple. So this area, the outer court, which is outside the temple, John was told, don't measure it. Don't measure that area. That's not, I'm not staking that area out for my own right now. And those people right now are not my own. Currently, on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, the Temple Mount still exists there. And the stones of that Temple Mount are enormous. But on top of that Temple Mount, as space, by the way, of about six football fields in dimension, on top of that, that, that temple mount sits the Muslim shrine called the Dome of the Rock. Yeah, if you see pictures of Jerusalem, you see this golden dome right in the center. That's the Dome of the Rock. Sits right on the temple mount. On the far southern end of the temple mount sits the Muslim mosque called the Al-Aqsa Mosque. But to the north of the Dome of the Rock sits an open plaza and there's a small cupola covering 
an exposed piece of granite right there on that northern plaza area. The Muslims call that, they call it the Dome of the Spirits, or they call it the Dome of the Tablets. What tablets? The Ten Commandments. That's what tablets. It's likely that that's the very location of the Holy of Holies, where the, the Ark of the Covenant once sat with the tablets, the Ten Commandments inside. Isn't that incredible? And in that area, the, the, the Jewish Talmud tells us that if the high priest stood in the Holy of Holies and he looked out through the holy place and across the courtyard of the temple, that he could look out like I'm standing here looking at the back door. He could look right out through the eastern gate. And I've stood there. I've stood right there in that location. In fact, I was scared to death to stand on the Holy of Holies. <laughs> but I've stood right there in that location. And that location lines straight up with the eastern gate, which, by the way, is built upon the foundation of the old eastern gate. So it is highly, highly likely that that is going to be the location of the Jewish temple that will build, be built during the first half of the, rep, uh, of the tribulation. Okay? You don't have to move the Dome of the Rock. You don't have to get rid of the Al-Aqsa Mosque. In fact, right here it says, don't measure the outer court. That stuff, the Dome of the Rock, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, all that, given over to the Gentiles. Don't need that. That's not mine. I'm not staking that out, God says. But this area, I'm staking out. And these people, I'm staking out. These are mine. See how that's working? Mm -hmm. And the Jews, by the way, will. They will rebuild their temple. They don't have to. We know that as believers in Christ, but they will. They will rebuild their temple under, get this, under the patronage of none other than the Antichrist. He will allow them to rebuild their temple. He'll make a treaty with them for seven years. Halfway through that seven-year period, he'll break that treaty. And if you go, right, if you go to Jerusalem today and you go to the Temple Institute in Jerusalem, and I've been there, you can see all of the articles for, for uh, worship, for sacrifice, for offerings, all of that, uh, the high priest garments, they're ready to go. All they need is the word that says, go, build your temple. They've got the plans. They've got everything they need. The golden menorah that goes in the temple, it's already built. And every year they try, to, they try to move it a little closer to the temple mount. So it moves. I've been there twice. And the first time, it wasn't in the same location. It was the second time because they move it. That golden menorah is, I mean, it's huge. So it's this temple that those Jews who are faithful to worship the one true and living God that are marked out by God as his own during the first half of the tribulation before the Antichrist turns on the Jews. It says here that they, the unbelieving Gentiles, will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. That's three and a half years. But they're not going to tread the temple or those who worship there during that time, the first half of the tribulation. And you can read about that, by the way, in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, where he will make a covenant with them, with the many, for one week. That's one prophetic week. That's seven years. He being the Antichrist, the prince of the people who will come. Okay? You can read about that in Daniel chapter 9. So he'll make a covenant with them. He will allow them to rebuild their temple, and they will. In addition to all that, God sends his two witnesses to minister during this time. Look at verses 3 and 4. And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days. That's, again, three and a half years. Clothed in sackcloth, these are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. 
So during the first half of the tribulation, three and one half years, or 42 months, or 1,260 days, all of these, by the way, are the same length of time. That's 42 30-day Jewish months, and that equals 1,260 days, or three and a half years. So it's a, the same period of time. So during this time, the first half of the tribulation, God sends two witnesses that they are they're, that they are clothed in sackcloth. Tells us something about their ministry. They are calling the nation of Israel to repentance during this time. They speak forth the word of God. It says they prophesy. That's what that means. They also have power that comes from God himself. And we have a further hint of their ministry in verse 4. It says, these are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. And this verse takes us back to the, the prophet Zechariah. He prophesied during the rebuilding of the temple after the Babylonian captivity. In chapter 4 of Zechariah, we have a description of these witnesses. The, and this chapter, by the way, had a near and a far fulfillment, which uh, many prophecies in the Old Testament were like that. They had a near fulfillment, but they also were a picture of, of a far, a further and complete fulfillment. And the same is true of these uh, uh, prophecies concerning the witnesses in Zechariah. The near fulfillment in Zechariah was with Zerubbabel, the, the civil leader, and Joshua, the high priest. It was they who led the nation in rebuilding the temple in the days following the, the Babylonian captivity. But here, in this, in this final fulfillment, these two witnesses are identified who likewise uh, witnessed to the nation of Israel during the rebuilding of this last day's temple. We also read in Zechariah chapter 4, verse 14, that these are the two anointed ones. Remember those words, anointed ones, who stand beside the Lord of the whole earth. It's the same as we read here. And, and by the way, that phrase, anointed ones, that means sons of fresh oil. Sons of fresh oil. We get oil from olive trees, you see. They're described as olive trees. And oil in the Bible is, is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. So we see that these two witnesses will be continually filled with fresh oil, the fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit. They're furthermore described as two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. They're not the light. That's Jesus Christ, the light of the world. But they hold forth the light of God. They hold forth the revelation of God to the world, just like a lampstand holds the lamp. So these two witnesses are empowered by God. They speak forth God's word. They preach repentance. They are filled with the Holy Spirit. They hold forth God's light. And the period of time that they minister is three and a half years, 1,260 days, that first half of the tribulation period. Now, who are these men, these witnesses? The next verses give us some clues. Look at verses 5 and 6. If anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. These have the power to shut heaven so no rain falls in the days of their prophecy. And they have power over waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with all plagues so often as they desire. Now that should sound familiar to many of you who know your Bibles. Now there was one particular prophet in the Old Testament who had the power to call down fire on those who tried to harm him. That was Elijah. And we read about him in 2 Kings chapter 1. Elijah also had the power to stop the rain from falling. Uh, in 1 Kings 17, we read about this. 
It's also referenced in the New Testament, book of James, chapter 5. Elijah also did not die. He was caught up to heaven in a fiery chariot. In addition, we read this in the book of the prophet Malachi, chapter 4, verse 5. It says this. It says, Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great, remember that word great, and terrible or dreadful day of the Lord. So Elijah returns before the great tribulation before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Jesus called that second half of the tribulation period the great tribulation in Matthew 24, verse 21. So we can be sure that one of these two witnesses is the prophet Elijah. In fact, the Jews have been expecting his return for thousands of years. During the Passover meal, the Jews always set one empty setting, one empty seat, one empty plate for Elijah. And then during Passover, they get up in the middle of the meal and they go and open the door and they look out because they're expecting Elijah to return, you see. Isn't that interesting? The other witness just might be Moses. Since he had power over waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as he wanted in the land of Egypt. His death was also, by the way, unusual in that God buried him. We also read in the New Testament book of Jude that Michael, the archangel, contended with the devil about the body of Moses. Now why would Michael do that? Maybe it's because Moses was going to need that body again during the tribulation. In addition to all this, we see that there were two men, Moses and Elijah, who showed up from heaven to meet Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. So we can't be 100% certain, but we can be pretty sure that these two witnesses are Moses and and Elijah, representing the law and the prophets. In other words, representing all of the Old Testament revelation to Israel. And their ministry is described here in this chapter. Just as the first half of the tribulation is ending, and just before the second half begins, we, we get this, this detailed uh, look at their ministry. Now, someone asked me last week, about Enoch. In the book of Genesis, we're told that Enoch never died. It says that Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. And the question was, why can't Enoch be one of the two witnesses? Some people think that he is. And Enoch was certainly unique before the flood, just before the flood, God took him. I believe Enoch was a picture, an Old Testament picture of the rapture of the church before the first judgment. You see, Enoch was a type of the church. God took him out of harm's way before the judgment, before the flood. Noah and his family were a type of the Jewish nation. They went through the flood to the other side. The unbelieving world of Noah's day is a type of the unbelieving world today. And they perished in the judgment. And the same thing is going to happen during the next judgment, the tribulation. So Enoch's sudden departure from earth was, was a picture, a type of the rapture. And the corollary question to that is, doesn't the Bible say it's appointed for men once to die and then the judgment? So why doesn't Enoch have to die? Well, the answer is, not everyone dies. Did you know that? Not everyone dies. At the rapture of the church, the church will be immediately resurrected, or immediately transformed in the, in, the, in, the, in the twinkling of an eye. 
at the last trump. So those who are here at the rapture, hopefully it's us, <laughs> will not die. So Enoch doesn't have to die either, you see. So that's not, that's not necessary, biblically speaking. So I don't believe Enoch has to come back and die. So likely, again, likely these two witnesses are Moses and Elijah. Now look at verses 7. Isn't that incredible to imagine that Moses and Elijah are going to be back on planet Earth witnessing, sharing, calling down fire on folk? <laughs> Man. Look at verses 7 and 8 now. When they, that is the two witnesses, when they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them overcome them and kill them and their dead bodies will lie in the street of that great city which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt where also our Lord was crucified so these two witnesses are indestructible until they finish their testimony and that testimony lasts for 1,260 days, the first three and a half years of the tribulation. But after that, after they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. This beast is the Antichrist. And we'll learn more about him in chapter 13. He is empowered by Satan. And at the end of their ministry, he is then given the power to kill them. But not before. They are indestructible before that time. In chapter 13 of, of Revelation, we're told in verse 2 that the dragon, that is Satan, gave him, that is the beast, his power, his throne, and great authority. Then in verse 3 it says that it, that is the beast, that it had been mortally wounded and his deadly wound was healed. So that's probably why it says here that he ascended out of the bottomless pit. Because he was dead. He was mortally wounded. He was killed. So he died. This whoever this is, this Antichrist, this person, mortally wounded, died, was sent to the lowest part of hell. And then he was revived and empowered by the devil himself. So the Antichrist, after three and a half years, is then given the power to finally make war against the two witnesses, to overcome them and kill them. And this happens in Jerusalem, by the way, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt because of its immorality and because of its worldliness at the time. Now look at verses 9 and 10. Then those from the peoples, tribes, tongues, and nations, that's the whole world, will see their dead bodies three and a half days and not allow their dead bodies to be put into graves. And those who dwell on the earth, speaking of unbelievers, whenever you hear that term, uh, earth dwellers in the Bible, the speaking of unbelievers, and those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry, and send gifts to one another, because these two prophets who tormented those who dwell on the earth. So, when these two witnesses are killed by the beast, what a description of the Antichrist, by the way. He's a beast, beast of a person. The world throws a party. In fact, they make it a, a, a holiday. They rejoice over them. They make merry. They, they send gifts to one another. It's Satan's version of Christmas. They even broadcast their deaths over the news and all of the rest of the networks. The fact that they don't even give them a proper burial is the greatest show of hatred and contempt. They just let them rot on the ground because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. So they hated them and they made their deaths a holiday, a cause for rejoicing. 
Even today, we're seeing this attitude in our own society. The unbelieving world has bought into the lies of the devil. They call good evil and evil good. And they shower contempt on anyone who might disagree with them. Today they are canceling any voice and any opinion they disagree with. And they rejoice when good men and good women are put to shame. When they lose their jobs or they lose their voice or influence in society. So it's not hard to see where this is going. Society at large is going downhill to the point, so far downhill to the point that they will one day rejoice when God's servants are murdered. Isn't that something? But as Paul Harvey used to say, there's more to this story. Look at verses, I love it when you you recognize Paul Harvey. Look at verses 11 and 12. Now, now, after three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies saw them. And you can almost see it in your mind. Full 24-hour-a-day news coverage on all the major networks. They're, they're broadcasting. You can see the broadcasters, you know, with their, their microphones. I got one here. Standing in front of the dead bodies in Jerusalem, right? Broadcast, yeah, they're still dead. We hate these guys, you know. They're going on and on, right? You can see it. And as they're broadcasting, <laughs> all of a sudden, the breath of life from God entered them. And behind them, they're broadcasting, and and behind them, these two guys stand up. (laughs) And it says, (laughs) and it says, great fear. I'll bet it did. I'll bet it will. Great fear fell on those who saw them. Great fear. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven. They heard it. They heard this voice saying to them, come up here. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud and their enemies saw them. So they hear the voice of God calling them home. And the world with cameras trained on them and jaws agape watched as they ascended to heaven in a cloud. (laughs) And their enemies literally saw it. Verse 13, in the same hour, there was a great earthquake and a tenth of the city fell in the earthquake. 7,000 people were killed and the rest were afraid and gave glory to the God of heaven. So within an hour of the ascension of the two prophets back to heaven, a destructive great earthquake struck the city of Jerusalem and a tenth of that city fell. 10% of all buildings Uh, in Jerusalem came crashing down. 10% of the roads were destroyed. 10% of the fields, the water, the electric, the gas, the food were all destroyed within an hour. And 7,000 people were killed. In the Greek language that the New Testament is written in, uh, this word people means the names of men. It might be that these were the the prominent men, the leaders, maybe even the leaders working with the Antichrist who were singled out by God for destruction. No wonder the rest uh, were afraid and gave glory to the God of heaven. And that doesn't, by the way, mean that they they were saved, but they recognized that God was in this thing, that God had raised these prophets, that God had destroyed a part of this city. They recognized that. And they gave glory to the God of heaven. But it also says that they were afraid. Fear fell on them. So like most men and women, when they get in a jam, right, they turn to God until they're past that jam, right? That's kind of what this is as well. 
Now look at verse 14. The second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. Back in chapter 8, verse 13, we read that, uh, that there was an angel flying through the midst of heaven saying with a loud voice, Woe, that's one. Woe, that's two. Woe, that's three. Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of earth because of the remaining blasts of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. The first woe was a demon-possessed uh, locust who stung men like a scorpion for five months and, and men could not die at that time. The second woe was a demon-possessed army of 200 million that killed a third of the remainder of mankind. That's almost two billion people. And when the seventh trumpet sounds, the final woe will be unleashed. This woe will be the seven bowls of the wrath of God, which will be worse than any judgment this far. All the judgments this far affected a part of the earth, uh, a third of the plant life, a third of the water, uh, a third of the fresh streams, uh, a third of the sunlight and, and moonlight. So a third of everything was affected. But now, in this final woe, God is going to, God is going to affect all the earth with these judgments. And these will be the final judgments that will complete the wrath of God and it will usher in the return of Jesus Christ to set up his kingdom. But first, the scene shifts back to heaven for the remainder of this chapter. Look at verse 15. Then the seventh angel sounded that's the seventh and final trumpet. So now the trumpet has been blown. And there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Amen. Amen. So when the seventh angel sounds, there was this proclamation in heaven. It was the proclamation of God's victory over the kingdoms of this world. Now even though more judgments are coming, and even though the world's armies will amass for the final battle of Armageddon, God's victory is assured. And is proclaimed to be assured. It says the kingdoms of this heaven have become. That's past tense. It's a, it's a done deal, you see. God, God speaks as if this is already finished. It's already done. And of our Lord and His Christ, and He shall, He's coming back here. It's future tense now. He shall reign forever and ever. So in the future, Christ will reign forever and ever. Now look at verses 16 through 18. And the 24 elders who sat before God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give thanks. We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was, and who is to come, because you have taken your great power and reigned. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that you should reward your servants, the prophets, and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. So at the proclamation that God's program was about to be completed, and in fact quickly be completed, the church in heaven represented as 24 elders who sat before God on their thrones. And, and if you're not clear about why that's the church, then go back and watch our video on Revelation chapters 4 and 5 for a detailed description of why these 24 elders are the church. But they fell on their faces and worshiped God, declaring his victory, declaring the judgment of the wicked, and declaring the rewards that the righteous will receive. When it says the time of the dead that they should be judged, that points to the coming great white throne judgment in chapter 20 of Revelation, where all of unbelieving humanity is judged by their works. It says books are opened. 
and all of their works are in the book. And none of their works were good enough. None of them. You can't get to heaven on your own by your own good work. Amen? You can only get there by putting your faith and trust in the work and person of Christ alone. Amen? And again, here's how it worked. And I know you've heard me say this in the past. But all sin, all sin, every one of your sins will be judged. And it will either be judged on the back of Christ Amen. or you will pay that judgment, pay for that judgment for eternity apart from Christ. See how that works? Either Christ has taken the wrath of God for you or you will suffer the wrath of God for eternity. <coughs> One or the other. And it all depends on whether you have put your faith and trust in the person and work of Christ or not. We also read here that you should reward your servants, the prophets and saints, and those who fear your name, small and great. So that then speaks of a different judgment. It speaks of the judgment seat of Christ, the Bema seat. The same word was used for the podium on which Olympic athletes stood to receive the reward for winning the race. You will receive those rewards. So the unbelieving world stands at the great white throne judgment, but you stand at the judgment seat of Christ, not to be judged, for Christ has taken your judgment, but to receive rewards Amen. for the things you've done for Christ in this life. If you stand at the judgment seat of Christ, you won't have to stand at the great white throne judgment. Amen? Amen. Look at verse 19, our, our final verse of the morning. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. And there were lightnings, noises, thunderings, an earthquake, and great hail. Anybody ever uh, see the movie Raiders of the Lost Ark? Where they, they search for and, and try to find the ark of the covenant before the Nazis find it? It starred Harrison Ford? Well, people have been looking for and speculating as to the location of that ark for thousands of years. Stop looking. Here it is. It's in heaven. And before God unleashes the final judgments of his wrath upon this Christ-rejecting world, he opens heaven. And the ark of the covenant was seen in his temple. This scene reminds believers that God will keep his promises. Amen. God is a covenant-keeping God. And it displays to the unbelieving world what they will be missing because they have turned their backs on God's salvation. Then the sound of the coming final judgment is heard. Lightnings, noises, thunderings, an earthquake, and great hail. The earth shook, the sky rained down great hail upon the remainder of unbelieving humanity as God prepared to pour out the final bowls of his wrath. Another storm of judgment was on the horizon for this Christ-rejecting world. Wow. <laughs> what a chapter. If God had not directed John to write down these things, we might think that this was a work of science fiction. But it's not. And unfortunately, we are seeing the preparation in this world today Amen. for this final rebellion and the judgments that we're reading about in the book of Revelation. And, and again, I am just in awe and amazed as you should be as well that God has chosen to reveal this to you Amen. to reveal this to us Amen. to give us this picture of the future you know Jesus said I no longer call you servants but friends I no longer call you servants but friends you know what I share details with my friends I don't share them with people I don't know. 
right? I share them with my friends. And God calls you his friends. And so he has chosen to share this with you, his friends. Isn't that amazing? But God is preparing this world for all that we're reading about here. Have you noticed the wicked are getting wickeder? Who would have believed the things that we are seeing in our nation and world today 10 years ago, 20 years ago? A news media that is wholly given over to lies, that is deceived. The rise of communism under the the heading of progressive. The acceptance and promotion of gross immorality as if it were normal. The cancel culture and the elimination of free speech. The unrestrained rioting and looting in some of our major cities and on our university campuses. Cities and universities that were once beautiful and wonderful to behold are turning into ghettos. Have you seen the trash left behind by some of these anti-Semitic rioters on these campuses? It's like a garbage dump when, when the police clear them out of there. Nothing is left but trash. And who can forget the deaths of more than 66 million children killed in their mother's wombs? God does not forget this. Our nation and our world are heading rapidly toward judgment. We, the church, need to be vigilant. We need to watch. We need to stand up for the truth of God in the midst of a Christ-rejecting world. And if we don't stand, and if we don't pray, and if we don't share the good news, who will? Who will? We, we, the church today, just might be the last generation of believers before the return of Christ. We are living in prophetic times. There is absolutely no doubt about it. We are living in prophetic times. We're living in the days of Elijah. We're living in the the days when God restores Israel back to the land of Israel, right? Ezekiel, chapters 36 and 37. God raises Israel dry bones and puts them back in their land. We're living in that day. And again, Israel is like the, the major signpost on the prophetic highway telling us the return of Christ is near. Now the next several chapters in the book of Revelation will will continue this break in the narrative. The trumpet is sounded, but now we get another parenthetical section where more personages uh, and their roles in the tribulation are, are revealed. And then in chapter 16, the narrative again, the chronology again resumes before the pouring out of the final bowls of God's wrath. So stay tuned. There's more to come before we read about the return of Christ to set up his kingdom on earth. If you've been watching or listening to this series and have never given your life to Christ, now's the time. Today can be the day, the day of salvation for you. You don't have to go through the time of God's judgment described here in the book of Revelation. You can be saved from the wrath to come. Amen? Amen. Amen. All you need to do is repent. That is, turn from your sin. Turn to Christ. He alone paid the price for your sin on the cross. Ask Him to come into your heart, to come into your life today. Surrender. To his love. Amen? Amen? Amen. Let's pray. We'll have the worship team come back up for one final song. Heavenly Father, once again, thank you. Thank you for this amazing chapter. Thank you for, for unveiling and revealing not only Christ, but the future to us. That you would share these things with us. We are so blessed to know. And, and Lord, you said that, that we would be blessed if we read if we heard and we kept the words that are written in this book, 
And we're certainly blessed, Lord, to think that we are not going to have to go through this period of time because Jesus delivers us from the wrath to come. So we are blessed, Lord. And we're blessed this morning. And I pray for those that are among us this morning that are celebrating Mother's Day. For the mothers among us. And for all the women among us, Lord, that this would be a day that they are blessed. Blessed of you. Blessed of their families. Blessed by their husbands. Pray for a day of blessing for them. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.